So, um, uh, Rochelle, you have everybody that's in attendance? Yes. Yep. Okay. All right. So, the first order of business is minutes of the previous meeting. Does anybody have any comments on the minutes of the previous meeting? Nope. And then comments or concerns of any person present. Now, I know it's really super hard for me to know who wants to talk. So if you could use your little raise your hand uh, button. And as I see them come in, I will take them in order. And I see that Rafi's already raised his hand, so he'll go first. But if you want to speak, please raise your hand and I'll take you in the order that you raised your hand. So um, do I have a motion to approve the minutes, by the way? Uh, so moved. Second? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? None opposed. Uh, the minutes are approved from the May 29th, 2024 meeting. Okay, so moving on to item two, comments or concerns of any person present? Uh, Attorney Podolsky, you had your hand raised. No, no, uh, we've taken care of that because it was just to move to approve the minutes. Yeah, I'm sorry, <laughs> a little scattered. So do we have comments or concerns of any person present that's typically about things that are not on the agenda, but I suppose you could talk about anything you want. Is there anyone that would like to speak under this section? Okay, so nobody, uh, seeing no one, I'm gonna move on to DCP complaint and inspection reports. And mm -hmm. I would like to hear anybody from- Anybody hear me? Good morning, Pamela Brown from the Investigations Division, Director. Anybody hear okay. me? Who is, is that you, Dave? Who's saying, can you hear me? Dave. Yes, Dave, we can hear you. Hello? We can hear you. I'll send a chat to him. Okay, so why don't we keep going with DCP while I work with Dave to get him uh, listening to the meeting, okay? Pamela, would you like to go? Oh, sure, I just basically, you have the report. I just wait for any questions that the advisory commission may have. You know, my question, because I hate when we do the complaint thing, <laughs> we hate when we do the complaints. Is there anybody that you guys did an inspection that didn't get approved for our license? Maybe that's like an, a, you know, to me, a, more of an interesting or more of a something that I would be interested in knowing is if an inspection was done for a license but wasn't granted. No. So we changed the way that we do things. Um, what we used to do in the past is have all the renewals come in and then they would get renewed upon inspection. Of course, it was very hard to get that done. Sure. Um, one of the requirements, of course, is having your credential posted when we were on site. So uh, we changed that around and it's a legislative change that allows us to inspect mobile homes over the course of the year, provided that we see them once per year. Uh, so no, there haven't been any renewals of parks, mobile home parks that have not received their credential. Okay. So that would have to be a new process would have to be go before legal for compliance meeting and revocation there, but no, everyone gets their renewal upon applying. Okay, well, that's good. That to me is a good indicator. So could I, could I pursue that a little bit? Um, so if you do um, an inspection, I'm sorry, is it, I didn't raise my hand here, but can I go ahead? Yes, yes. So if, go. We're if, good. You do, if you do an inspection, okay, if you do an inspection in the middle of, of the, of a, of a, of a, a leasing year or of a, of a licensing year and the time comes for the license, is the, is the assumption made, how, how do you know at that point whether the park's in compliance? You, because I would tell you, old. for most inspections, we do not find parks that are 100% in compliance. There's always something that we 
tend to discover while we're there, and it's going to result in more than one inspection. So, of course, we do the initial inspection. We send the violation letter out. We're corresponding, um, having conversations with the park owner, depending upon what we find. Of course, there may be a tree that needs to be cut down or potholes need to be repaired. So we're we're in constant contact, looking for invoices. We'll do a reinspection. So it's normally not one and done. Okay, so it's one and follow up, and then we do a reinspection to make sure everything is is the way that it should be. So and then so we're the, seeing them again the following year. So when the time comes for for renewal, you will look at your file on the park and determine that there is no. No, no outstanding uncomplied with order. No, so we start every year in January. All right, so that's when we're going to start and we work our way through the course of the year. Of course, you know, we've seen them re the, the year before and we have the new ticket program. So if there's a park that's not in compliance, that's not cooperating, that's not doing what they should, then of course they would receive that ticket program that we discussed during the last um, meeting. And that, again, brings them through the judicial system, but also in front of uh, legal de dealing with uh, Cynthia Fernandez attorney. But, but it wouldn't affect the license renewal. No, it would have to be after the fact. So the renewal will go through and if there was an issue of non-compliance and that will be written up and sent to legal. And it will address okay. so, so what I, I guess I, I'm sorry, but what I'm trying to understand is whether because the way the new system works, the the threat of withholding the license is not is no longer a form of enforcement that, that there are that other forms of enforcement are w w being used, but you would not hold back a park's license because you'd send something to legal, for example, and there was still a dispute going on. Correct. So there's this threat of the getting a ticket and also you know, going before legal. Those and, are the, and fines, the right? Of, that's the enforcement tools that we have. And. But but is there a send is there. I guess I'm just trying to figure out, I mean, maybe there are no parks that fall into this category, but I'm trying to understand what happens when you have sort of an ongoing issue and either the park isn't being cooperative or it's being kind of semi-cooperative and doing some of the things but not doing others as to how the, how the the ongoing inspections blend into the licensing or if they are now two completely separate things i mean if you issue a ticket for example i'm assuming that means the person pays a the park owner pays a fine but that's not the same as correcting the condition so we take both paths. Yes, they issue a ticket, they pay a fine, and they are having to cure whatever the issue is that we find, and that goes before legal. So there's two pathways of enforcement that that is handled. But I would tell you that for the most part, we do receive cooperation. We do allow for time for remedy of whatever it is that we find. Okay. Okay, um, uh, Dave, Dave, uh, do you would like to speak, but I, I actually raised my hand first. Um, I have a quick question on the, the complaint list. Um, there seems to be about 10 complaints on this list that were closed since our last meeting. And, and I think that DCP has made it pretty clear in the past that they can't talk about open complaints. Uh, is is there uh, if the commissioners want to see what some of these complaints are about the closed ones? Is there a way that we can get information on that? Sure, just send me an email. Okay, because in all in, in meetings in the past, when there were a couple of three or like two or three closed complaints, they gave us the information before the meeting. So if anybody had any questions, but. Um, you know what I'll what I'll do is is um, I'll send you an email, Pamela, and maybe you know is it easy enough to send us at least some information on all these when we when we get the list? So sure. when if you I look at uh, column P, any column P, it explains. We got copies of them. If you look at column P, it explains what the 
resolution is on that particular okay. case. All right. So I'd if like you to need more detail, please email me. Yeah. I'll be happy to send that out. So we, we received a list with all of the open and closed complaints, and there are about 10 of them that were closed since June 1st. We last met on May 29th. So if anyone looks at the list and wants more detail, please get in touch with me and I will send Pamela an email and ask for more, more detail on that complaint. Now, and in the past, I've seen if there were one or two closed, the, the copies of the whole file are attached, but this is a lot. So, and it was a lot before. Sometimes they'd be very, very lengthy complaints. So if anyone has any questions about a specific one, let me know. And then I want to move on to Dave, you have your hand raised next. Yeah. Um, sorry, I'm late, folks. Um, a couple of things as a follow on to, to Mark's um, query about whether there's ever been, uh, whether um, how often parks are denied renewal. Um, I'm just wondering if that's ever happened. And then uh, based upon the, uh, the recent activity in, um, uh, park sales um, that's come up since the uh, right of first refusal law was passed. Uh, is there any kind of criteria um, for new owners who've never been involved in the in operating a mobile home park? Are they scrutinized any differently? Um, because I think that's the case in at least one of them. Um, so that would be my question. Has there ever been a park um, that was denied renewal? For example, I'll just give you an idea. Um, I've been to a couple of different parks, including my own recently, actually, um, where low hanging utility wires were snagged um, once by a, um, a, a truck that was delivering a new home and the following day by a garbage truck. Um, and I had suggested to management that they should look into this <clears throat> several different times. I'm wondering, and I've seen that in other parks uh dan billings is here uh i've seen it in his park there's a section of your park dan i think you'll confirm that it has some very low hanging utility wires um and i've seen it in a, in other places as well and is that ever is that kind of thing ever considered as in a decision as to whether um park owners granted a license renewal if it's an ongoing problem okay so you have a couple of different questions there uh, mm -hmm. One is, has there ever been a park denied renewal? I will have to look into that. I don't have that information readily or in my head at this moment. Uh, utilities, I would have to see where that falls within our, whether it's in our jurisdiction or not. But I tell you that if we find we're out and about and we find growth, you know, over the meters and things like that, we do notify the park owners. But uh, utility wires, we'll have to see whether that's us or um, another jurisdiction. And I know you had the third question, but I wasn't clear. I don't remember. I don't even remember it either. Okay. Almost, I'm sorry. <laughs> but, you know, if you have, if you're out seeing something, please, you know, send us an email, um, send us a complaint. We're happy to go out and look at it and we can address the issue. But if we don't know about it, of course, we can't look into it. So please feel free to email me directly if you want to submit a complaint or go through our complaint module. Okay, Liz, um, if, if I may, um, uh, Dan Billings is here. We we have now we have a re resignation from Art Mizzou, resigned from the uh, alliance this past week. Um, so that's a vacant position, and we. I'm sorry, I can't hear you, Liz. You have a, a resignation from this council? Yes. Okay, I wasn't um, aware of that. Oh, well, I, I, I the, the, the letter was just the letter was just mailed to uh, Senator Bob Duff's office this week. Um, okay. So, so that's that 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 letter was effective immediately. Um, okay. So Dan Bill, we and we then we had another vacant position prior to that. So yep. uh, Dan Billings is going to fill uh, one of the vacancies. Uh, I'm glad to see him here today. I have another gentleman who uh, was expected to be able to make it, um, Mike Trolley, and uh, I will have him um, at, uh, at, I'll send his qualifications to the appropriate appointing authority, but we're going to have those positions right. filled. Well, I, I, there, there is a process. You you have to apply 
to, yeah. to there's a process through the state of Connecticut, you have to apply for an open position. So, I mean, yeah. you can't just say he's going to take his place. He has, Dan, you have to go through the process like, you know, the rest of us do. You know, you fill out an application and you answer all of the questions. And I do know that I believe there is, there was already a vacancy. Let me see. We had already had one tenant vacancy on the council openings, but we yeah. can't just say Dan's a member because he has to, he has to first of all, we have art hasn't resigned yet <laughs> apparently we, we're not aware of oh, it, so. I, i'm so i i dan was so, dan was here at the last meeting i'm sorry to bring it up un so unexpectedly but dan, you would like to and that your plan is to do, correct yeah. right. yes well dan, the, dan, dan you want to I, dan has submitted the paper dan has submitted the app the the uh necessary documentation okay. to the governor's yeah. office and yeah. i'm going to have the application submitted for the other vacancy that Arch just resigned from hopefully yeah. within the next week. I, I just wanted to give you a heads up. That's all. Nothing. We don't expect. Yeah, that's uh, Ricky, you have a comment. Yeah, I just want I just wanted to clarify the uh, the the you know, different people have different appointing authorities. And uh, my understanding is, is that appointments and, uh, you know, resignations um, and appointments go through the respective appointing authorities so that one of the tenant vacancies um, is a governor's appointment, and the other is um, uh, a, a Senate Majority Leader appointment. And it's my understanding that the uh, the statute says the alliance um, is is supposed to make a recommendation to the appointing authority. And it's my understanding that in both of those cases, um, the alliance is making a recommendation. And that Dave was just trying to let you know. Who I don't think there was any suggestion that that they were skipping the the right. appointment process. It's it's just that the appointment process doesn't go through us; it goes right. through the appointing authorities. No, I I agree with you, but but I guess what I'm saying here is I wasn't aware of any of this till just this moment. And if the council is supposed to make recommendations, um, you know, Rochelle, do does do we get notification of these applications? How how does that work? And how do we make a recommendation? <laughs> no. now, uh, Liz, if I could, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt, but I, I guess I want to be clear. The council does not make recommendations. Oh. Uh, when, when Bennett was chair, he often uh, brought names in advance to the council to see, just I, because he was interested in the council reinforcing the, the statutory authorities but okay. there's nothing that there's nothing that requires that. The, presumably, the, the appointing authority will notify DCP when when it's made an appointment, and so Michelle may not have. So this is merely a heads up. This, yeah, I, I, that's that's you know, the same thing would be true, for example, with with the um, Park Owners Association, which by statute has the right to designate who it wants for the four park owner slots. They they also each have their own pointing authority. And um, I, I mean I think it's fine as a courtesy to let us know, but there's there's nothing in the statute that requires that they go through the council. No, well when you said the alliance makes recommendations, I so thought it's, it's to the appointing it's to the appointing authority, not to the council. All right. Okay. So right. All right. So, so no, I don't have a problem with this. I just want to make sure that I'm following the process. I don't know what it is um, because, you know, I've only been chairman for a short time now. So, um, yeah, I think it's great because we have, if one person's resigning, we already have one opening. So, yeah, I think, I think it's great to get two people that are interested in sitting on the council and, and that's it. I just was questioning the process. I don't have a problem with it. While we're on the topic, could I ask, there's another vacancy, which is the uh, lending industry vacancy. Um, yes, there is. And, and I, I actually don't, I, know, I think we talked about this at a prior meeting, but is, is something happening on that front? Because that's, I think, I believe, apart from the, res, the, the resident park resident vacancies, I think that was the only remaining vacancy that needed filling. It is. And, and I don't know of any action, but I will get in touch with Rochelle and 
and I would have to look at minutes and I can't recall what the council wanted to do to try to fill that. So, um, I mean, I, I, think I was hoping that the park owners might have somebody in mind based on their knowledge of, of, um, well, of lending. For, for things. No, I, get, I get it. So okay. you can, if anyone knows anything, we, you know, certainly you can reach out to me directly or we could take it up at our next meeting, but our next meeting will be until December now. So um, who, but, who, who approves that appointment, Rafi? Uh, I'm sorry. Who approves that appointment? Wait, that bank. Oh, um, I don't know. We have to look at the statute. I have a feeling it's the governor, but I, I'm not sure. What about the park owners? Wouldn't they have any thoughts on lenders too? No, because most, most lenders, I shouldn't say that. Most banks don't lend to mobile home, mobile homes. Right. right? I just so didn't, you're I dealing, didn't know. you're dealing with yep. You're dealing with private entities, so I think that's where the issue is. I, I surely can reach out to Priority and um, and uh, Nancy. Did we ask? Um, did we happen to ask Rich Delia if he ever wanted? It's too far for him. He's out of, he's in New York, but he lends in Connecticut. No, we never asked them. Okay, so I, we have two people we can ask that lend lend to our residents all the time, but I don't know that they're interested. But I'll ask. All right, and so folks, uh, uh, residents, if you if you have you know if you know of anybody, you know, please please put their name forward. That would be great. And, and does it, Rafi? Do you know it? Does it have to be somebody? Does it have to be a, just a lender, or does it have to be a bank? Um. No, I don't think it has to be bank. I mean, I think we we all should take a look at the statute. The statute basically, I don't have it in front of me. I can, well, I'm counting I, on you to tell me what to do, buddy. All right, that's 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 fair enough. I mean, I think the, 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 this illustrates the very problem because the reason there is supposed to be somebody who's involved in financing of, of mobile homes is because it's a way of getting that industry to be more receptive to doing mobile home mobile home lending and the and there were at some point some of the local banks that did that did such lending yep. but the fact that we can't find anybody or don't know of anybody who's doing it is kind of illustrative of why the council is supposed to have such a person because the point is to get to promote that aspect of the industry so um yeah. yeah. Again, yeah. we're not having any it's trouble getting people. Because if they're not doing it, then we can't find anyone. Find anyone. Well, that, yeah, well, we're, not, we're not having trouble getting money to people. Keep. I just want to be yeah. clear. We're every. You know, we're not having any. No one's having trouble finding lending. It's just not getting it from local banks. You know, so there's you know private. There's the private. There's specific lenders that are in this space that lend to customers all the time. The reason local banks don't do it is because the at the time the delinquency rate was high and there's no land. Right. So they don't they don't they can't attach any land. So that's why they got out of it. But there's plenty of people that lend to it, just not local banks. Um, I want I want to um, I want to recognize Ben, because actually I was thinking that maybe Ben you had had some discussion. If you if you if you raise your hand and you want to sp you finish speaking, please unraise your hand. Uh, but Ben, if you it, I, I know that you're new here, so I remember. I think you might have had some discussion about with us at a meeting. So I'm recognizing you. Take you have the floor. Okay, we, it's been in a uh, in the past though that we've known. It's well, I, I've been on for over 20 years, but it's always been a broker that's been for reference to uh, re representing the uh, the banking industry. There was never I can't remember any specific lender, private lender, a bank. It's been a realtor, a real estate broker? No, a real estate broker. I'm sorry. A mortgage broker. A mortgage broker. Okay. Yeah. That's what Mark said. It's a difficult thing. Mostly, it's the finance has gone through brokerage. I mean, it's um, since I've been in, in business almost 50 years now, it's been mostly we've gone through mortgage brokers. Okay. All right, Dave. Did you have? Did you no, have another I comment? I'm, I'm sorry. I don't know how to. I don't know how to unraise my hand. So <laughs> there you go. You did it. There you go. So, so Ray, you you do did raise your hand. Do you have another comment? Well, I, the statute says one representative of the banking industry 
to be appointed by the governor. So the phrase is the banking industry. It's not clear. There is no definition of banking industry. And so it's not, and, and I think, and um, Ben is correct that our, when we did have somebody who participated years ago, I believe it was, it was the, like the, the, the mortgage lending industry, it wasn't in it. It was not yes. from actual banks. Um, but I think anybody would be suitable if we feel somehow that we can fit them into the phrase banking industry. Okay. okay. I'll, I'll could, take the lead on Colin. We kind of went off on a, uh, we're, we're I'm sorry. went off, um, uh, I think I missed something. So we have DPC inspection report. We're all set there. I want to move on to DCP legal. So do I have someone here from DCP legal? And Rafi, you should unraise your hand if you, you finish that over. Is there, is there anyone here from DCP Legal? I do not see anyone here from Legal. Okay. All right. So we're going to move on to report from CAFA. All right. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Yep. Excellent. Okay, so I actually have a, quite a few things to go over today. Uh, one's my normal update, but one is a new program that we're looking to implement with some improvements that we uh, feel work will kind of uh, eliminate many of the hurdles that the current established program have. Uh, so basically, with regards to volume, um, Capital for Change, who handles our mobile home program, they received 15 new applications uh, since the last update, which is quite an uptick. Yeah. Uh, however, only six of the 15 were eligible for the program <clears throat> or credit and uh, insufficient income debt to income ratio were some of the reasons that the underwriter had mentioned were uh, were present with the ones who didn't qualify. Uh, the total purchase applications uh, received since March of 2021 now stands at 99 for total applications. How many closed since we last met? There's been one closing since the last update and three loans that are currently in the process to close. Uh, that then brings the total closed loans since March of 2021, when this program was kicked off uh, to 15. And then how many applications received uh, for the refinance program? They haven't received any new applications for that since the last update. So that number holds firm at 16 applications and obviously none have closed either so only six have closed since they implemented that refi program but with regards to that uh, the director has been working with uh, leadership to improve the program with some funds that we have let me see if I could share my screen here not the best with technology uh, here we go okay I think I'm sharing my screen now are you guys able to see uh, the CHFA logo Yes, we are. Great. Okay. So, oh, too fast. Here we go. So these are the programs that we're looking to implement, hopefully sometime before the end of the year, fourth quarter is what they're thinking. But they've had uh, discussions and it looks like this is gaining traction. But CHFA is proposing a combination of the refinance program and the purchase program. So currently right now the purchase program is whatever the prevailing rate is, which uh, is 6.375, let's say. Uh, and then the refi program is at 1%, which is a great rate, but has its hurdles with loan to value ratio being 80% or less. This program is going to combine the two programs and simplify it with one interest rate being a flat 3% fixed. Uh, if the loan amount exceeds Five thousand uh, dollars, up to one hundred fifty thousand dollars. It's going to be amortized for thirty years at that fixed rate of three uh, percent. However, if the loan amount is under five thousand, again the rate will be three percent, amortized for fifteen. Uh, then here's here's where it really gets interesting. CHFA is proposing that we're going to finance a hundred percent of either the purchase price or the appraisal value. Uh, Therefore, you know, we're not going to require that 20% down payment or equity in the uh, application anymore, which is great. The maximum loan being the 150,000 that we talked about. If the borrower is to buy, let's say, uh, a property and it exceeds the 150, they can contribute their own funds to go above that 150. Uh, okay. 
And then we have current funding for this program set aside and earmarked. It's 5.75 million is what I've been told. Uh, capital for change again, you know, when we've talked to them about the hurdles that they see uh, with regards to declinations, uh, the biggest challenges that they've seen are obviously the borrowers being able to have that 20% down payment or having 20% equity in the property. Uh, so with this program going up to 100% loan to value ratio, that should help tremendously uh, with those hurdles. And uh, we're hoping that, you know, with this money, you know, we're going to have good success with uh, helping people qualify and therefore, uh, you know, obviously helping more people either buy their property or refinance out of their current situation. Okay. That's amazing. That's amazing. Thank you. Yeah, that's, that's, that's really good news. Yeah, I'm very, very he, excited. Um, Brian, is it, would you say that this, how long has this, have these changes been in place? Uh, these proposed changes have been talked about for the last couple months. So, kind of right after our uh, our talk, our last meeting, I believe, is when the talk started ramping up more with executive leadership. Uh, and again, this is uh, you know kind of their framework that they're proposing, and it sounds like it's gotten some support. So, my director told me that she estimates that sometime in the fourth quarter this will be launched. Oh, the fourth well, quarter of this year. Fourth quarter of this year, correct. So. Know. Your hand so I can take you in order so we don't we get we try to keep the meeting orderly. So fourth quarter of this year, so September. I mean October. Uh, October. Sometime between October and December is the hope. Yep. Now other than you know us folks on this meeting, this how does CHFA um propose to promote this program? Because especially with the big changes, I think it'll make a difference for a lot of people. Um, is there any plans to promote it when you're ready to launch? I would imagine so. I mean, we'll certainly, I'm sure, be promoting it amongst our social media accounts. Uh, that's for mm -hmm. sure. Uh, I don't know about print media or radio ads at this time, but I will mm -hmm. check with my RMO department and see uh, if there are any plans for that kind of advertising. And I'm sure we'll have flyers available that, you know, everyone can download and maybe print amongst their community. Uh, you know, we'll certainly have, you know, downloadable flyers that, you know, realtors can use, uh, you know, park owners can use and so on. Is there a way, um, and, and this is just a thought and it's not that bad because there's not a lot of them. Is there a, perhaps a suggestion that I would have is send notice of the new program to the planning committee? So, like uh, Southeastern Connecticut Council of Governments, and then what they do is they'll send a blast email to all of their representative towns. Uh, and we find out, we, we local planners, we find out a lot of state programs because the COG is made, uh, the, you know, the Council of Governments is made aware of them, and then they'll forward them to us as an FYI. And then in our individual towns, if someone, you know, is, is we could forward it to our mobile home park owners, you know, we could do that. So that's just a thought and that's just a suggestion on, on my part. And um, I'm going to unraise my hand mm. now. Do yep. you, uh, anybody else have a comment about that other than I think it's great. Thank you. I, I put my email in the chat, by the way, if you guys would love to or would like to email me suggestions on how to get the word out, uh, you know, please, like you just said, you just gave me a lot of details there right there. Uh, please send me those uh, so I don't kind of forget them. I'm not a very fast writer and uh, I'll be happy to uh, do what we can to assist. But yeah, I'll be happy to take any questions. No, I absolutely will do that. And I'm writing the email down now. Um, who else has their hand raised? Ben, you have your hand raised. You're up. Yeah, I've got a question. And over the years, um, similar programs have come in front. This has been going on for financing since, God, since I remember, since day one. And the big problem always has been is the guarantee of these loans. For years, and still is, is FHA was always involved. And once FHA gets in their guidelines, it's been a problem. But with FHA, like anything else, you know they were the, uh, they were guaranteeing uh, the loan would therefore a buyer or excuse me or well, refinance whatever three percent down. Um, but many going back even more maybe thirty years ago, actually the state of Connecticut came down with a program and I said I reminded uh, everybody about this. They were doing it their own insured. They would do the, they were their own PMI, Correct. which I thought was an excellent 
this again, we're going back to 20% down. And that has always been a problem. The 20% Correct. Down. So I should point out that the proposal of this program up to 100% MI, uh, on, uh, uh, up to 100% LTV, is that oh. we will not be requiring the borrower to pay MI. We will be self-insuring it. So it's not an FHA loan. It's, you know, there's no MI company involved. So that eliminates another major hurdle. But the loan to value, though, again, it's getting back. It's, it's 80% of loan to value. No, this no, program will go up to 100% yeah. Yeah. with no MI. Okay, so if this home is worth the, it's the, the value of the, it comes at 150000 Maximum 150, that is correct. 150000 yeah. yeah. So like if somebody wanted to buy a, a property for 175, they could hopefully, hopefully they qualify and they can get this program for 150 and then they would, you know, obviously come up with the rest of the money themselves, the 25000 mm -hmm. One thing that I saw in the PowerPoint was that the other 25 can't be financed. So somehow the folks if in that example would have to come up with 25,000 in cash. If they were buying for 175, exceeding the yeah. 150 maximum, yeah. Yeah, so, so the, cause they could, in other words, they couldn't refinance and put a second mortgage on it. Well, I mean, go back to your PowerPoint cause that's sure. where it said, over anything over 150 would be uh, here we go maximum loan mm -hmm. yep was it i saw that it said can't oh maximum loan about 150 borrower must pay anything above and cannot finance so what does that mean no other loans correct so when they close on this mortgage they can't have any subordinate financing piggybacking on this correct what if they took out a personal loan that wasn't secured I would imagine that would be okay if they qualified with the debt because that wouldn't be a lien okay. against the property. Right. So they could somehow maybe take out a loan, but it couldn't be anything that was secured by the, the lender. So Correct. I guess. Yep. All right. That was my question. Thank you. Oh, that's a good question. Okay. Sure. Okay. Any other questions at this time? Well, no, feel free if anything if anything pops up i have my email there and uh, certainly i'm very open to suggestions on uh any ideas to spread the word once this program become is launched uh because you guys obviously understand the community much more than i do um but i will also you know in the meantime ask my marketing department when this does get launched sometime in q4 uh you know what is aside from the social media platforms and having a downloadable flyer you know what other ideas are there for advertising and spreading the word great thank you no problem okay so if we don't have any other questions for brian thank you very much for bringing no that, that 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 was no, an my, important update thank my you. colleague uh, colette's on the uh call as well to talk about uh multifamily. Okay, Colette, you are up. Uh, no Thank updates. you, Brian. Oh, no updates, perfect. <laughs> okay, no updates on multifamily. <laughs> okay. Um, all right, so that that no with no other comments or questions, we'll move on to item six, which is old business. Item A is public education and promotion and visit to mobile home park spring of 2024. Well, obviously that didn't happen. That probably should have been spring of 2025 anyway, because I was just able to get in touch in the summer. Unfortunately, um, I'm, I'm going to tell you that my job for the next six months has uh, gone up to a whole nother level. So I will certainly work to get that done for 2025. We, we recalled that 2024 was a short session. Um, so, you know, we were trying to figure out how to get the folks uh, to a mobile home park. Um, and so I haven't done much on that. I will, I will have to say, other than my visit to um, the, the Sun Communities, three parks in Montville, which has different sort of levels of parks. Of communities. And uh, we thought that would be good because there's an older one, sort of a mid-range community, and then another community that the, the homes are a little bit more expensive and are, you know, have stick built, um, you know, additions and whatnot. Um, so I will continue to work on that, but um, you know, I'll have to bear with me. It'll probably not be until next year. 
uh, House on the Hill, 2025 legislative session. Now, you know, we talked about we've talked about this a couple times, right? Um, and Mark had said that, you know, I think I think it was you, Mark, and you can hop in that said that you would be interested in helping to arrange that, but it would have to be when somebody ordered a home, right? Yeah, there's a lot that goes into it. So I, I think, you know, the first step, I think what we said is let's get people to tour the stuff first and then let's see how that goes before we delve in to bring in the home somewhere and right. doing all that. So I think we ought to just stick with the first part of it, which is to get tours of properties with legislators um, and, and to see, you know, people that are interested in promoting our industry. I think that, right. and, well, and if, because if we can't get them to tour, if we can't get them to come out to something that already exists, I'm not going to be able to get them to come out to a house on the hill. So I think we should right. just focus on getting some promotion within what okay. we have today. So, okay. And maybe we can do a couple of tours, one at this end of the state, maybe one at the other end of the state, and we'll see what we can do there. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I, you know, we are in the in the process of trying, as you guys may or may not know, but you know, we we are in the process of trying to build a new community um, in Waterford, um, and we got all the approvals and everything, and it would be the first kind of new community like it. Uh, but the residents have decided to the abutting residents, I should say, have decided to sue uh, to injunction to stop the mobile home park from being built. Uh, so we're dealing with that right now. Is that outside of the regular appeal period for planning and zoning? Yeah, it's outside planning? of the appeal period. Yep. They're claiming adverse possession because uh, some of the land falls onto where people put a, a swing set and a, and a, a tool shed uh, and a, a small swimming pool and some other things that they decided to wait until after, way after the approvals to uh, claim adverse possession. Gotcha. So it, it literally stopped the whole project. Now that starts, it stops the whole project. Let me ask you a question. Why? And this is coming from a zoning person. Is it, will it affect the entire uh, project design or? No, we, we may have, no, we may have to, we may have to lose some homes if we right. can't, if we can't resolve it. Right, but does that stop you from proceeding with the project? It, it, ha it has, it has so far. You, I know why you're asking. It has so far. But okay. We are work. We are working to just get the permit and start construction and. Okay. Hope for the best, but well, I mean, they, we should we should have already put a stake in the ground. Um, yeah, I mean, if you're building a home in the area where someone's claiming adverse possession, it. Yeah. All right. I'm just, I know, you know, I'm asking, I'm just the zoning person that works this stuff out at a local level. Right. So yeah. that was my question. So, okay. All right. Thank you. All right. So that's unfortunate, Mark, because I think it would have been a nice little community in that it's not, area. It's, all, it's only been three years. Yeah, I know. I know. So can, I, can I ask a question about this? Um, Sorry, David. Like and Rafi, you're up next. I'm, okay. Go ahead, Dave. Uh, I'm just curious. Um, is this a permitted use in Waterford? The, the mobile yes, home it's a, actually was done under the 830G statute. Okay. And um, so the how long has the squatter been uh, occupying the land? Um, there's a legend. There's no. There's no way. There's no way. There's no way to know when people put a sh well. I guess a shed you could see on some stuff, but you know the swing set's ridiculous. The little portable swimming pools ridiculous. It just they were against it from the beginning, Dave, and they're yeah, hired it, an attorney. And eleven of the eleven residents that have bought the property have decided to join to file an injunction to stop us from building the community. Um, and and what and and um, Liz asked the right question is it's way after the appeal period. They had time to appeal. So we, I'm not, we're not sure why they were able to even accomplish the injunction on it after they had they had time to appeal during the appeal period and no one ever spoke up. So, um, yeah, but it was done under 830G. So to be honest with you, losing homes is really is not a is not a good thing because there's only 47 to begin with. So, you know, be, there's a point where you lose enough homes, it's not worth doing it. And maybe that's their maybe that's their game i don't know their game but okay. well good luck all right maybe you you unraised your hand are you good 
You're on mute. You're on mute. Still on mute. Uh, yeah, it was my questions answered. It was whether it was under 8-30G. Okay. Yes, and it, and it was. And actually, we just approved uh, a 10-unit mobile home park in Ledger under 830G as well. So, uh, and yeah. that project, we just issued, no one appealed that one, and we issued a zoning permit. We don't expect any issues now. The one in, how many units was it, Mark? In 47. Waterford? Yeah, 47. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, this is and I'm helping. I'm obviously, you know, I'm helping with that ten. So, yeah, I got you. Okay, all right. So I think one of the biggest part of our discussions is coming up, and um, that's discussion of formation of combined. No, wait a minute. Where are we? Okay, so discussion of formation of combined legislative, educational, and finance policy committee. I'm not sure why that's under D B there. We should probably move that under committee reports, I guess, or I, frankly, I don't remember where we were with that one. There really, we haven't had any discussion about that. At this point, we've basically said it would be difficult to get one committee to combine all of those. Can anyone refresh my memory? Rafi, go ahead. Um, I, I think my feeling is we de facto have already combined the committees because it seems to me there's a kind of working group that brings yeah. together um some of the resident representatives and some of the park owner representatives um to kind of meet sort of outside of our regular quarterly meetings to talk about a variety of issues and it's sort of it, the, the effort to have to separate out legislative from other issues i think is hard to do so it seems to me we've we basically have such a committee and it probably has um a sort of a, a an, an unfixed membership, which is to say whoever who's ever interested in really pursuing those discussions, you know, should should meet. And uh, I'm hoping, you know, we, that, uh, later on the agenda when it says committee reports, um, I'm hoping that we'll, there'll be a, a sort of a next follow up meeting soon. I thought that was a constructive first step uh, there. Th th we talked about a particular issue at that meeting, but there are other issues that seem to come up. Um, and so I think that's, I think hopefully that would be a good way of um, an environment for trying to discuss some of those issues, which then could be brought back, say, to a quarter, to a regular meeting of the advisory <laughs> council as a whole. So I, I think, I think it's actually, oh, the committee's de facto have been created already. Right. Maybe call, it a policy, call it a policy committee or something like that. A working group, whatever we are. And I like that that idea of getting together in between our quarterlies as well. But let's let's wait till we get to the committee report. So under seven, I have no new business listed on the agenda. Um, uh, number eight is committee reports, and it's a legislative, educational, and finance. And basically, it's a report of the eight eight so August eighth, twenty twenty four subcommittee working group meeting regarding new legislation. And I'm going to let uh some of the folks that were sort of leading that discussion uh start this conversation so uh, um uh i i think it was mark and miriam and 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 rafi there were sort of like uh who wants to go first please raise your hand or tell me or speak up mark you want to go first i didn't did i raise my hand no no <laughs> I, I don't know where Mir i don't know where miriam is today so i was kind of hoping that yeah. Who wants to go first? Because I'm not going no, first. It, on it, it's fine. We just we po we posed something that was an issue, you know, which had to do with probate, um, and we're working. We proposed what we some of the things we thought would be helpful. Rafi was going to do a little research, uh, because that's what we count on him for, and um, and he's gonna we'll regroup and and figure out the next step i think I, the most important part of it was everybody agreed that it was an issue that was worth being worked on and everybody was in agreement and something we should do there's nobody being hurt by it you know rafi's comments was he just wants to protect the people who are have an interest in the home and of course we want the same thing so there's nobody it's not like it's a kind of an issue where we have an existing resident these are people that have passed away 
and we just want to protect the you know the family of that person to make sure that they're being treated fairly. But I think it's one of those issues where there's really, for us, it's really no reason to agree on trying to make it better. Um, and so we did. We walked away from that meeting saying that, yeah, we want to fix the probate issue and the time it takes to get possession of homes. Um, and then that's what we're going to work towards. Yeah, I don't know good. anything about how the, how you propose the legislation. That that's where you, you know how you propose the language and then get somebody to take it take it up. You know that's that's something that is outside of my my knowledge base. But you know once we decide what we want to do, we've got to figure out how to get the what we want written and then get it presented to somebody to to get it you know up the ladder. So so Mark, for those of the people that are on this meeting that were not on the working group meeting. Can you sort of just give a very brief summary, either you or Rafi, about what legislation there was a general consensus that this would be good legislation to put forward, and it's regarding abandonment, correct? Abandonment, include no, include no. We we wanted to separate the abandonment, a normal abandonment process from the probate process, which is correct. when a resident right. when a resident passes away. So we just wanted to focus on the probate part of it, which is that today, it takes upwards of two years to get possession of a house after a resident passes away. And the goal is to do whatever we can to shorten that, shorten that timeline. Because in the two years, the home deteriorates, the park owner's not getting rent for two years. And at the end, usually you have to remove the home because it's become so deteriorated that somebody who could have use gotten that home for a, a decent price loses that opportunity and you end up having to replace it with a new one which is fine because it's it's also good to replace old homes with new homes it's better for the community it's better for our, our business it's better for everything but at the same time you know you still want homes that are fifty thousand dollars right or something around there that people can afford and if a home becomes uh, deteriorated because it's left alone for two years then somebody loses the opportunity to get into the community into something they can afford. So I think, you know, like I said, the community owner loses because they're lo losing rent and it costs almost $10,000 between the time you start the process of probate and remove the home. So I'm out $10,000 and then I've got to bring in a new home, which takes months between the time you order it, get it, get it set up and then sell it, right? So you could be a three year process, if not longer, uh, to replace that at home during probate. So we just want to come up with a way to shorten that process that's fair for community owners, but also fair to the family that somebody may be a, 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 a you know somebody may have been involved or should be involved in notification of that family member's uh, estate. Uh, a lot of times, what happens is we, the community owner, are actually opening the estate on behalf of somebody we don't even know, uh, and know we all, and, and we become the fiduciary for that estate, which just is ridiculous. So on top of having to get trying to get possession of the home, I'm also responsible to be the fiduciary. <laughs> uh, which means I could be responsible for administering things that I don't even know about, you know, that assets that they may have. So we want to try to fix that. Yeah. Uh, Liz, I, to me, the most significant thing that happened at the meeting was, uh, at least for me, was the understanding that the proposal was not, even though it was sort of labeled a proposal about abandonment, was not actually about abandonment but rather about the seed about someone who's died and right. and so one of the underlying questions is um what is to what extent you need different procedures when you're dealing with uh, someone who's died then you're dealing with a person uh who's abandoned uh and i mean i don't think i think i think where the consensus is is on the notion that that needs to be addressed. I don't think we've reached the point ex as to exactly how we think it should be addressed, but I think that there was a consensus that we need to try to figure that out. And from my point of view, um, that makes it hopefully easier to do because we're the, the sort of the direction we're going is not to see if we can shorten how the abandonment process works so much although maybe the, i think we're going to look we'll look at it but more about how how we deal with with someone who's died and and there's no obvious entity taking taking control on behalf of of of, of the uh 
the person who dies. Anyway, so I'm, I'm, bas I'm, I'm more or less agreeing with Mark, but just being a little more cautious about how close we are to agreement. But I, would, I think we're, we're going to be able to get there. Yeah, I mean, it seems one of the most absurd things to me is that a park owner has to open in the state. Um, I mean, it just sort of boggles my mind that that has to happen right now. So I agree that there should be some proposal that could be put forth for dealing with that separate from the abandonment. So, so that's that are, that's my thoughts on it. And, you know, as Mark said, you know, you open up an estate, you're the executor of an estate. And what if there's assets you don't know about? What if there's relatives that you don't know about? And um, it seems like the park owner is not the person to do that to me. So um, anyway, that's that's my thoughts. Does anyone else have anything to add to that? If not, we'll move along. Under correspondence, I... Do we have correspondence, Rochelle? Did we have correspondence? Was there a correspondence piece? I do not receive anything. No. Okay. I don't. I don't have any correspondence, um, and that leaves us to. Unless anyone has any last-minute comments you want to make, that leads uh, uh, leads us to a motion to adjourn the meeting. And one thing I will do is we should try to have another working group meeting, if possible, maybe in November sometime. Um, well, so maybe yeah, I think maybe you want to do something earlier, right? You don't want to wait till November. I think, yeah, I think I think if we're going to propose, let's if one of the end results is proposing legislation, we need to push it forward. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, all right. We'll so I would say so maybe late maybe late September or. Right. Okay. Late, late September. Late September works. Okay. Right. Okay. Just that'll work. So so just just we'll put that we'll put a a bookmark on that and then. Somebody, we can talk about who's going to, you know, put out a meeting and set up the Zoom. Um, so, okay. um, so that's good. Okay. So, wait, wait, I got, wait, so I got a, that's good. I've got a comment and a question. Who is this? Albert for Rich. I'm on the phone. I couldn't get. Uh, I'm out on the road, so I can't be on my computer. Like okay. Usual. All right, Albert. How? What's your What's your question? We're at the end of the agenda, so. Uh, yeah, that's ahead. why I was waiting because there's no other uh, way of getting, you know, I can't raise my hand on the phone. But the thing is, when the when the discussion came up as far as the lending thing, in the past, I've actually gone and tried to look for it. I couldn't find anybody who was willing to lend. I went through a couple of banks. They're treating uh, any kind of money to somebody that owns a mobile home as a personal loan. So, you know, I've tried in the past to go through the, that lending process and nobody has been able over the years to actually tell me who is willing to lend money to mobile home owners in this state. Maybe there's a, a list of it now at this point, but there wasn't in the past years. So, you know, that if there is people that are doing that business, then it needs to get out to the people in the console. Cause I have no idea who's willing to loan, lend money to the home, mobile home owners. And and the other question. Was that? You're, on the, you're not on the list. Spell your last name, please. H-R-I-C-Z. I'm an advisory council member. Oh, okay. All right. I didn't I didn't catch the last name, and that's what I thought, but I looked in the meeting list, and your name wasn't listed. So, okay. Thanks, Al. And you okay, had so something besides that, yeah, one other question. I, I've heard something, and I don't know just how true it is. That's why I want to ask at the meeting. I've heard something about in, in communities where people have central air conditioning, you know, a unit on the outside, that type situation. If people uh, run into a problem where they can't afford to uh, put a new system in, I heard something about the, the state will allow homeowners to put window units in. Does anybody know anything about that? I'm not sure I understand what you're saying. Neither do I. Well, in, in certain communities, it's only allowed to have a central air conditioning unit in your home. But there are people, I, I run across them, that don't have the money to put a brand new unit in when there's ties. And they've tried to put window units in. But because the, the park is run with a, a saying of you cannot have window units, I heard something mentioned uh, through the state somehow that window units are acceptable and the communities cannot deny them. 
So I'm wondering if that is actually a fact or it's just something that was out there in a win. I don't know the answer to that. Um, the, the the next person who had their hand raised was, I mean, certainly it, it seems to me that, you know, it's like zoning laws, right? Like zoning laws, you know, people have to comply with zoning regulations, but they may have deed restrictions on their their properties that are more restrictive than even our zoning regulations. But um, I don't know about that. I mean, certainly I can ask our building official, but he's not here right now, but I can ask the building official for Ledyard and see if he knows anything about communities can't denying it. I mean, that's really a legal question, I think. Okay. Versus, a, versus a, you know, us just talking about it question because you're getting into, you know, maybe, maybe state building code allows it, but if there's restrictions within the community on the 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 park, you know, I I think that those would become first. But anyway, uh, yeah, Dave, it would, be, it would be under the aesthetic standards of the community. But I, I I mean, I'm a community owner. I I've never would ever ever restrict somebody from being able to cool their cool their house because they had a window. I mean, they're not the best looking, but I and so I understand it. But I, I don't I I don't condone not allowing it. I, I mean, I just, I get it. I get it from a community, you know, from a aesthetic standpoint, but we should look into that. That that shouldn't be something that we should restrict. Yeah, I don't right, want to make a deal out of it. I, and I'm surely not speaking on, on behalf of every owner, but I'm just telling you, that seems like a, yeah. a tough, a tough thing to take a stand on. Well, that right. might be a question for me. That might be a question for DCP legal, right. and I just also say they have their hands raised too. So, yeah, if somebody can just research it a little bit and maybe come up with a solution. Um, if, if I may, uh, Al, I think the first thing you do is look to your lease for the individual community. I, I, I think that if it's not, if the lease is silent, um, I think maybe Mark could verify this, but. If the lease is silent on the issue, then I think uh, they'd probably be, they could probably okay doing it. But I have not heard anything about the state getting involved uh, in overriding uh, a lease provision or some a rule within the communities. I have not heard that anywhere. Rafi, you're up next. Um, um, I had another, I had another question. <laughs> okay. Um, do, you, do you have something to comment on that part of his question? No. Okay. All right, Al, you're up. What's the next part of your question? No, well, that was it. Just that I had those two comments. All right. And who else? Dave, you had another well, comment. Yeah, I, I, I just, I, wanted, I just wanted. I'm sorry. I just, I just wanted to. I sir, I sent out a, a uh, an email this morning. Uh, we had a brief discussion at the end of the last. I guess it would be called a legislative committee meeting. Um, and if we're going to have a, another legislative committee meeting on trying to resolve the. Um, the issues surrounding abandoned homes, I'd like to add uh, something to the agenda about addressing uh, potential uh, legislation to uh, mirror the five-year lease provisions that are available in Massachusetts. Okay. Rafi, you're up. Um, two comments. One is, um, it, it, when as Al was speaking about the difficulty of getting bank financing, and we earlier talked about the, the, the vacancy. It strikes me that we may want to try and bring in someone from the banking from the banking department, because part of this has to do with with to what extent uh, the Connecticut statutes were amended in the 1980s for the purpose of treating mobile homes in mobile home parks as real property uh, and rather than personal property. And one of the motives behind that was to get lenders to lend in the same way they would lend for real property. Now, there may be practical limits because they don't have access to the land as, as collateral, but that was that was the reason for having uh, for having someone from the banking industry. But the banking department regulates the banking industry in Connecticut, at least for the state chartered banks and for and for non federally non federal lenders. And so maybe that's a conversation somebody should have with the with the banking department. We should have about what is the banking department doing to kind of implement that policy, which is not an explicit statute, 
but implement the policy. And it affects taxation because it, there is an explicit statute that says you tax mobile homes as real estate, not as personal property. So that's one thing. Um, the second thing is in regard to the window units that, that Al was talking about, um, there is a statute that says here's the right, here's the responsibility, rights and responsibilities of park residents and of park owners. And it does list things that the park owner, that a park cannot prohibit. So again, I would put this into the agenda of, of the Legislative or Policy Committee uh, as to whether there should be a rule of some sort. And it might be regulatory rule, it might be a DCP rule rather than a statute, but should there be a rule that says either with either sort of you have a right to to put in a, a window air conditioner or within certain limits you have such a right. Um, I think it's worth talking about without really saying whether we should or shouldn't do that, but especially if it's something where there's an agreement that it's not a good idea to prohibit that, then maybe there needs to be something. So I would just also throw that onto the list. And again, I think all those things are worth talking about at the sort of a committee level and then seeing what might get brought back up here. Okay, and you're up next. Ben, can you hear us? You're muted. There we go. Um, there are, getting back to Al with the air conditioner, there, <clears throat> they may want to check with their towns also. There are some towns which have grants, have money available based on their incomes where they can borrow the money, but it's forgiven after so many years. So there are programs out there to help these individuals. Yes, and, and I can actually comment on that because I uh, coordinate the Ledger's Housing Rehab Program. The problem that we run into, and and yes, this is this is something that a homeowner, and of course you have to meet a certain income level um, to be able to qualify for the loan. We you apply through my office. I forward it to a deal certified consultant who meets with the homeowner and puts them through the process. There's a bid process, like we have a bid opening tomorrow, uh, tomorrow afternoon. Um, or it might even be today, but we have a bid opening process. We have a bidding process. Now, what happens there is, so when I was here in 2018, I had $100,000 that I couldn't give away in my housing rehab program. So I put an ad in one of those little ledger community booklets, and then I had a waiting list of 25 people that I couldn't fund, right? So what the town of Ledger did was they infused a, a good part of the ARPA money into this housing rehab program. And already that fund has been depleted. And the problem, so what happens is it's a loan, right? So we give a we give a loan. Um, sometimes we have to sub get the, the, the mortgage somebody to subrogate, but we do that. There's a, a loan document. What happens is if the property is refinanced or sold, the town is reimbursed for that money. There's no time limit for that. It's 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 a mortgage on the property. If 20 years, that person that got the loan passes away and the property is sold, that's when the town gets paid back. If a person refinances, that's when the town gets paid back. So there are such programs. And the problem with them, unfortunately, is is funds, right? Like it's the, the D, the for the housing, uh, was giving out housing rehab CDG funds for that, and they in the past three or four years they have not. They're they're putting their CDBG funding <clears throat> into public housing or, or you know multifamily housing, affordable housing, and housing rehab programs. That's why Ledger had to infuse ARPA funds into that. So that there are great programs, and maybe there have towns that have more funds in there, but that is something people can check with the towns on. Now, one thing that if you have someone whose septic system is failing versus someone who has, has a central air conditioning that's failing, septic system loan may take precedent over the air conditioning if there can be a window unit or something. So that's kind of how the program works. I just wanted to let you know how Ledger's works, Ben. Um, so it, that, it does. It sounds like it varies from town to town. I know some that yeah. the loan is, uh, you know, if you stay there for 10 years, right. after you do the improvements on it, it's forgiven. 
Right. Right. Yeah. So, ours, ours just gets paid back. Whatever. Yeah. yeah. So okay. So that is a possibility for some folks that they could check with their local town. Now, keep in mind, they don't own the property, right? So in our town, the loan is on the property. So how I'm not sure they would how they would do it for a individual home that could get tricky, an individual home on leased land. So that could get tricky too. But again, I'm not, you know. It's each individual town, and I'm not a lawyer, and I wouldn't get into that whole closing process. But that could be that could also be tricky with that. But that would be uh, a department in the city or the town that would offer that. Yes, yeah, so we, have, we have this the town of Ledger. We have a housing rehab program, and it was originally start funding from a CD, CDBG grant from DOH. When that funding ran out, there was the, the DOH was not giving out housing rehab funding any in the past few years. They used ARPA to replenish it. It also gets replenished once someone pays the loan back. Let's say they sell their house, going to senior living. We may get $20,000 back. And then that money, it's a revolving loan fund. That's how it works in Ledger. But there is a lien on property for the loan amount. So if... I don't know how they do that on leased land. That's what I mean, where there could be a glitch. The, yeah. the I'll have to go through Milford and yeah. I'll, have, I'll approach somebody in Milford and see if they know anything about it. I, I would ask her if they have like a housing rehab program. That's what we call it here. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Or sometimes people yeah. call it minimum housing. That's another term that's used. And it's basically, you know, making sure that properties are, you know, the meet minimal requirements for for housing so um that's what i would do is call your town call your land use department or the mayor's office and see what you can find out yep okay all right so do we have anything else i have so basically i left it with three items for the working group uh meeting the other thing i wanted to ask rochelle is could you find a name of a person from the Connecticut Banking Department that maybe we might want to invite to one of our meetings. Is that something you could do, Rochelle? Um, I could I could see what I can find out. I don't or, know for sure, but I'll see I'll see what I can do for sure. Or at least maybe, you know, put me in touch with somebody who can. I suppose we can right. just the website and see if we can get a name. But if you know of someone that you think we might be able to get. And then perhaps we can, as Rafi suggested, have someone from the state banking department, you know, attend a meeting and maybe we could talk to that person directly. That might not be a bad thing. Do you agree, Rafi? Yeah, I agree. Okay. All right. So other than that, I don't have anything else. And actually, I have to go into another meeting. So, um, oh, Dave, you have your hand raised. Do you have just, something else to say? Just, just briefly, I mean, there was that... Uh... That legislative committee, Mark, you remember, I think you and, um, I forget your lobbyist name, um, attended that banking subcommittee meeting. They were trying to make some changes to to stimulate lending. I don't know if somebody on that committee yeah, would saw, be. You, you saw how good that, that was. They, they wanted to put together a 40-year lease. So. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I just thought maybe that somebody, somebody they didn't that listen, attended. They didn't listen to a word I said, not one word. I, I have a couple guys, and Al, I'll, I can email you. I think I have your email address. The two companies that operate here and that operate within Connecticut in terms of financing for you know for people. Uh, but obviously, okay. this the CHFA has a great program. I mean, I don't. I wouldn't go any. I mean, I could just tell you right now, priority would be probably at six or seven percent, and uh, you know, CHFA is offering at three percent. I that's where you want to send people. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right, I get to jump off, guys. Ben, Ben, you have your hand raised. Do you have something yeah. to add? No, see, but the lend, uh, CHFA could probably give us somebody. They don't lend directly, I believe. You've gone through a lender that's approved by them. So they have lenders that are out there who's familiar with uh, manufactured homes or CHFA programs, period. Okay. Okay. All right. Anybody else? If not, um, uh, does somebody want to make a motion to adjourn? I move. I make a motion to adjourn. 
Okay, Dave, seconded. motion second. Seconded. Somebody seconded. Okay. All right. I, so so Mark made it and Dave seconded or opposite. That's fine. That's that works. All right. Whatever. One or the other. All right. And um and I gotta uh, go too. So then the meeting is adjourned at 11.46 a.m. And I hope everybody has a nice uh, long Labor Day weekend and enjoys Thank the rest of the summer. Thank, Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks. Good meeting.